Hi, and welcome to the 12th House Podcast. I'm Michelle, and on today's episode, we're going to do things a little differently. Today, I'm going to do just a couple questions. I'm going to answer some questions that have come in over the last couple months since we've been running the podcast, and we're going to go from there. It's going to be fun. <laughs> she says, with a little question mark in her voice. No, I'm really excited about this. And to just like have some transparency, we had some amazing guests <laughs> lined up for the podcast that I did interviews with, oh, last year in 2020. And when my hard drive crashed, I thought those things had been moved over to my computer, but they hadn't. So we lost some interviews. <laughs> We're in the process of getting some more. I think these are just things that happen. I'm just going to say that. Like, there's just things that happen when you are making stuff and it's all good. I guess it, that's how it's supposed to be. I also learned that you're not supposed to just like blast hard drives around. I didn't know this. I'm bad with technology, although I run a tech company and I love technology. I'm not good with hardware is what I will say. So I break external hard drives a lot. And it's because I didn't know you're not supposed to like walk around with them. I didn't know that. I just had it like attached dangling to my computer all the time. So anyways, I learned that. Hopefully that will save your external hard drive in the future so you don't run into the same issues that I have. And in the meantime, you get this episode because instead of a guest this week, I'm going to answer some questions. These questions have come in via email. They've come in through our community groups, the North Node and Holisticism Hub, and they've come in via our texting line. And that's literally a line that goes to my phone. So when you text it, I get it. And it pops up in like a little messaging app that's not my text. So I don't get like a notification or anything, which is great because when I get like 300 texts a day, it's not overwhelming, but sometimes I don't check it every single day. And then I'm like, oh, fuck, I feel so bad that I didn't check this like I normally check my texting. Anyways, in case you texted me and I didn't text you back for a couple of days, it's not like I'm not too cool. Trust me. It's just that I forgot to open the app. Okay. So anyways, that's the texting app and our text line. You can text it whenever you want. I may not answer you immediately, but I typically do answer, especially if it's an important question. So you can text us at the number in the show notes. If you just scroll down underneath this episode, you can text me there and I'll answer. <laughs> and I try to be funny. I try to send gifts like we're homies because we are. So these are some questions that I got from all of the above places. And I'm going to go through and try to answer them as honestly and also as quickly as possible because I don't want this to be a super long episode. I noticed that like all of our episodes have been like over an hour long. And if it were me, I'd be like, nope, Pasadena. So I'm going to try and keep this shorter. And oh, finally, I normally have like three pages worth of notes. And I normally, I don't know, take like an hour to three hours per episode, researching, writing notes, making sure everything's like cogent and cohesive. And I have no notes today, so other than the questions. So hopefully this will not be all over the place, but if it is, then it is. And then we'll never do it again if you don't like it. But maybe it'll be like your favorite thing. I don't know. Sometimes those are my favorite podcast episodes. When I get to hear the hosts of the podcast that I like, just like talk about their lives. I love the learning episodes. I love a guest episode, but sometimes that's my favorite part, like secretly my favorite part. It's not like why I go to the podcast, but it's a deep enjoyment happens there. So anyways, we're going to try it. Thanks for being with us. And if you like this episode, share it with your friends, share it on IG, shoot us a text and let us know you like it, rate, review, and subscribe, all of the above. That makes such a big difference in honestly... Because we are a very small team and because we have basically no marketing budget, we, we are so grateful for everything that you do to share our work. It is so meaningful to us. And like I said, the free content that we make, it takes time and it also costs us money to make it. And we're so happy to do it because we're so happy to share so freely with you and to like let you in and take this super accessible platform and like spread our message as much as we can and teach more people about intuition and mysticism and intuitive business and just being a fucking spiritual baller. And it's a cost for us. And the best way that you can like pay it forward is to share it with others. It means so much to us and it makes it all worth it. So thanks for sharing this episode. If you like it, if you don't like this one, share one that you liked. Okay. So I'm going to go into my questions now. 
So the first question, okay, maybe I'll tell you all the questions so that you can get excited. The questions I'm going to talk about are, I got a bunch of questions about being a projector in human design. So I'm going to answer that first. If you're not a projector, you can just fast forward like three minutes. I got questions about organizing your life as a freelancer or a business owner, including the tech tools, habits, and routines that I use. Another question about time management. So we're going to talk about all of that. A question about the platform Notion, which I am obsessed with, and I want to make everyone be on Notion, and it's my mission. A question about powerful nighttime routines. A question about the best books that I read in 2020. A question about how to use mercury energy in your natal chart and in your business's chart and like what to do with it, which I definitely want to talk about because mercury is the patron state of holisticism. A question about insights on community care. And then a question about sobriety and navigating sobriety. So I'm happy to talk about that in the Akashic Records. And then finally, navigating the ups and downs emotionally and mentally of running a business and being a human being. So that could be a podcast episode in and of itself, but I'll try to keep it short and sweet. And maybe we can double click on some of these topics in the future. All right. The first question, what are some juicy projector tips and tricks? How do you get organized as a projector and how do you do partnerships with other people as a projector? Great questions. So let's roll the tape back. What the fuck is a projector? (laughs) A projector is a type in human design. Human design is a system kind of like astrology to help people understand themselves. And there are five different types. There are Manifestors, manifesting generators, generators, projectors, and reflectors. And I'm a projector. So everyone on the planet is born into one of these types. And then you have all these gates and centers and channels and all these things that tell you a little bit more about who you are. But this is kind of like your blueprint, your overarching blueprint and your success plan. So your type tells you how you can be successful in the world. And then your channels and your gates tell you a little bit more about like how that success manifests or how the most you you comes out into the world. So I'm a projector. 20% of the population are projectors, but I feel like way more people are projectors. 70% of the North Node are projectors. <laughs> and I feel like there's something about the wellness space that attracts projectors perhaps, or I maybe like attracts like, I don't really know, but Yeah. So there's a ton of projectors that I am around all the time. And I feel like the thing with all human design is whatever you're not is what you want to be. So I desperately want to be a manifesting generator. My partner is a manifesting generator and I'm so jealous of him. He just like flits from task to task. Meanwhile, I'm like, I'm not like that. So (laughs) kind of always want what you don't have. And I have eventually grown to love being a projector, but it is kind of a boner killer when you first learn about being a projector because basically your not self theme. So when you're being like a dick is bitterness. So whenever you're not living your design, you're a fucking bitter Betty, which I'm deeply familiar with that. So bitterness is that's my comfort zone, to be honest with you. And your sort of strategy for success is to wait to be invited. And this is so antithetical to how we exist in the world as Americans, as human beings. We really live in what they call a generator's world where we're supposed to work like eight hour days and like drink coffee and, you know, get through to-do lists and tasks and like productivity, blah, 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 blah. And that's kind of like not the vibe for projectors. Also, by the way, if you couldn't tell, I'm a hundred percent not a human design reader. So this is just like my knowledge from sitting in on countless classes, getting a dozen readings and doing like a very minor dive on human design myself. I'm not smart enough to understand it is what I'm, I'm settling on. But this is all to say that as projectors are theme for success and our strategy for success is to wait to be invited. And this is the opposite of like how the working world exists and especially how like the strategies that the girl boss movement has sort of peddled people in order to be successful, right? The like elbow your way into the room and get your own seat at a table and like blah, 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 and like aggressively pitch people and own your shit and always go out on the limb and do one thing a day that scares you. And I get that. That is great. That is great if you are not a projector. (laughs) So I would say that the best thing that I learned as a projector was to own my own shit. And when I first 
started learning about this, everyone was like, oh, you have to wait to be invited. So you have to just sit back and wait for people to see you. And I don't like that. I vehemently did not like that when I first learned it. And now I have sort of like learned how to make that work for me, which human design is a grand experiment. So you get to figure out how it works for you. How it works for me is I cannot just like sit idly on the couch. That is not my bag. That's not like who I am, even to my detriment, right? I enjoy my work and doing things. So what is helpful for me as a projector is to know and create my own ecosystem of what my work looks like and why I want to do my work and to not try and impress other people with the work that I'm doing and not try to be like this bright, shiny object of like, wow, look how amazing I am. Don't you want to work with me? Really, what I need to do is just like put my head down and fucking do my shit and do it amazingly and know that as long as I am in my genius and I'm in my authenticity and I am aligned with myself that the right people will see me and I will do great work. And when I do great work, I will attract in the right people. They will naturally be called to me. And it might take me longer than others to be seen, but it's worth it. Because if I try to tell people to see me or like demand that they see me, it's going to backfire for me. It's kind of like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I just got to be that delicious, hydrated pool that they want to drink out of. I just got to sit there and be like, I'm water. I'm water. So you're going to want me eventually because I'm great. I'm delicious water. And just know that about myself. In the meantime, be my cool, watery self. So that's my biggest tip as a projector is for me, I, I create my own ecosystem to be successful and to do my own thing. And I literally think about just putting my head down and doing my stuff and creating my own universe. And eventually people will walk into that universe with me, especially if I make space for them. And I am like willing to invite other people in once they start to see me. So that's my big tip. Other projector tips and tricks. If you can get a team that aren't projectors, we have a manifesting generator, Wallace on the team and two generators, Janelle and Thais. So vibing off their energy really helps me like in meetings and when it comes to executing on projects and just having different energies so that they can pitch ideas and initiate ideas or projects or pitches. That's really, really helpful. Other projectors can invite projectors. So know your people, like know who you're into. And if there's someone you really like that you want to take initiative on creating a project or a partnership together, if they're a projector or a reflector as a projector, you can invite them. So that's a nice trick that I learned from my friend Shadi. How to get organized as a projector. I got a bunch of questions about projectors, so I kind of just like smashed them all together. The next question was how to get organized as a projector. I don't know. I kind of just like know how to get organized as a Michelle. So I don't know if this has to do with being a projector or not, but what really helps me my whole life, my mom had always told me I was just a mess. I'm like a messy person, a disorganized person, and that's actually not true. I'm a super organized person. It's just that my brain thinks differently than other people's. And I recently found out that I have spatial synesthesia. It's like not an exciting thing. Like 10% of the population has this. And basically we experience time and space a little bit differently visually and spatially than other people. So things like calendars and like organizing my desk and organizing my space and my digital space looks a little bit different than the average person. So some techniques and tools just really don't work for me. Like I hate using Asana and I just have to be okay with that. That's just not how my brain works. I often need to like spread out in order to get organized and then I can like sort of scoop everything up and put it in piles and organize it. But having things hidden away isn't always like the easiest for me. So I kind of need to like see a whole big map. That's just is how like my own spatial synesthesia works. Everyone's different. If you think you have spatial synesthesia, you should Google it and learn more about it. But as a projector and maybe as like this person, me, MP, I love using something like Notion in order to organize my thoughts. And I really like, as I said, being able to spread out and then sort of fold everything back in at the end of the day. So I'm not really a tidy as I go person. I'm a explosion and then organize. And then I really do need things to be organized at the end of the day. It's like, I need to put my brain back together. But in order to like mind the thoughts, deep down, I need to like 
unfold it. <laughs> so staying organized as a projector, I think having a system that lets you do that as opposed to a system that asks you to tidy as you go, where you can do like a big clean sweep at the end, that's really useful. And then finally, how do you do partnerships as a projector? I'm going to move on after this, but this is a little thing that I do that it's like inception. <laughs> I don't know if it actually works, but I like to think it does because it normally works. So I have ideas all day long for like people I want to work with and sh cool shit that I want to do. And so when I am percolating on something and I want to invite someone, but I know that I can't like initiate really the conversation. First, if I can get someone on my team to do it, I'll ask them to like take the lead on pitching someone an idea. Or I've even asked my partner who's an MG to like send emails for me because if they come from him, then it gets more well received than if it comes from me, even if it's the literally exact same email, which is amazing. And I hope has nothing to do with misogyny, but whatever. Let's hope it has everything to do with human design and nothing with people not liking aggressive women. Anyways, when it comes to partnerships as a projector, if I have something I really want to work on with someone, I'm like, this is such a good idea. I like need someone to like try, sort of take the lead on this, I will inception it into somebody's brain. So walk with me back to, I don't know, 2016 when inception came out. Maybe it's way older than that. Maybe like 2010. I don't know. Cillian Murphy. That's all I know. So walk with me back to Inception. The Christopher Nolan movie was about how these people would implant ideas into other people's dreams, into different levels of their dreams and basically in their subconscious. So they would plant an idea like sell your father's entire company to me. And then when the person would wake up, they would think that that idea came from them and it was their free will that was making the choice. <laughs> so this makes me sound so evil, but I kind of think like that, like sometimes we're planting seeds of ideas in other people, especially as projectors, when we're sharing with them how our brains work and what we're thinking about. And so when I'm excited about something, I'll normally pitch someone or like have an idea for a friend. And so I'll just talk to my friend about like what I'm excited about and what I'm working on. And I won't say we should do a partnership together or we should do a class together. I'll say, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about doing these really cool classes where X, Y, Z thing happens and this is the benefits and this is the pros and this is the cons. And I think this is how I'm going to do it, but I'm still kind of like sitting on it. And then I'll let them run with it. And like sometimes that means that they're like, that's really cool. And then they'll call me three weeks later and be like, hey, do you want to do that thing that you talked about? And other times they'll say, oh, my God, that's so cool. Should we do it together? And then they've kind of invited me to do it. And sometimes it doesn't work. And that's OK, too. And then I'm like, well, if they weren't like super excited about working with me, then we shouldn't do it. I don't want to be anyone's like roll their eyes. I have to do this partnership thing. So that's how I typically work in partnerships. I inception an idea. I mean, it's not really inception. It's just like you're enrolling people in what you're up to. And then when you do, typically they see opportunities for themselves. And so that's just how humans work. And if it's a good opportunity for everyone involved, if it's a good idea and it works for them and they're excited about working with you, they're probably going to ask to do that with you. And if they don't, then either you don't have a close enough relationship where they feel safe to do that. And part of your work can be making it a safe place for people to invite themselves in as a projector. Or like you're just not a good fit. And that's that's all fine. Okay, so that's it for projectors. All right, the next question is how to get organized as a freelancer or a business owner. The tech tools, the habits, and the routines that you use. Oh, my God. Okay, so I was a freelancer for two and a half years, consultant, and then I started holisticism. And I've been doing this for three and a half years. Oh, my God, almost four years. That's crazy. So I've been doing this for a while and I would say that the number one thing is for me was figuring out just what my energetic levels looked like, what my energy flow was. And I know now as a projector and a creative person that my energy flow basically looks like for two days, I am super on. I am like, oh my God, it's like I took smart drugs and like all the new tropics and I can just type so fast and do so many things. It's amazing. And then I have like three days of like almost feeling hungover. It's not feeling hungover, but it's like, oh, I really need to be horizontal and not doing anything and reading and re-nourishing myself. So I would say figure out what your flow looks like and then create your flow and build the container for your flow before you do anything. Because clients are hiring you 
And the beauty of being a freelancer or consultant is getting to say, well, these are what my hours are. This is my container. These are my boundaries. So create boundaries. If you don't create boundaries, other people will create boundaries for you. And guess what? They're probably going to be boundaries that you don't like because they're not for you. They're for them. So create your own boundaries. That's the best advice that I can give anyone who's a freelancer or who's starting their own business. The second thing is create your salary before you do anything else. So you might not even be making money right now, but set your salary, decide what you're going to make for the year. When you do, this is influenced by a a book called Profit First and also some like spiritual and metaphysical teachings that I've really been diving into when it comes to money and wealth. But set your salary, decide what you want to make in the year and then pay yourself that salary. So many freelancers and consultants and course creators and practitioners use their business as their sort of like piggy bank like, oh, I'll launch a new product because I'm like short on cash or, oh, I'll open up a couple of sessions because I want to make a thousand more bucks this month. When in reality, no, we should actually set the intention for what we want our salary to be for the entire year at the beginning of the year and then work to create that basically like almost working backwards. I promise you this will change everything in your life. It'll also make you so much more secure because you'll know how much you're getting paid every two weeks, right? Every payday. And that makes a world of difference in feeling safe. You're like, but I'm not making money right now. But you'll notice that there's an energetic shift when you create a salary for yourself. You're like, okay, this year I'm making 75K, which means every month my take home is going to be X and my bi-monthly paycheck looks like this you will start to create opportunities for yourself to make that salary. And you also won't be tempted to just pay yourself everything, right, that comes into your business because of that like feast and versus famine sort of mindset of like, oh, well, I don't know when I'm going to get paid next, so let me just cash out the business bank account and put it in my own bank account. By the way, if you haven't started a business bank account and you own a business, you should do that because it makes everything easier for your taxes And energetically, it's much better energetic hygiene for you and your business. It's just better. Trust me. So go start a business bank account. It is normally very, very affordable. You just have to deposit like $200 into your bank account and you should be good. So I would say do that. Those are like the sort of habits and routines and sort of energetic ideas, I think, around getting started as a freelancer or a consultant or a practitioner that I wish more people knew about because if we get started on the right foot, it's so much easier to scale and to not get burnt out, which is the point of creating routines and rituals is we want to promote longevity in the work that we do. We want to be around for a long time so we can help more people and so we can just like enjoy our lives, right? But some other tools that really help me And like keep our shit tight at holisticism. For work, I would say Notion is the number one best thing ever. And Notion is basically Google Drive, but aesthetically pleasing. It's sort of like a combination of Google Drive and Squarespace, where you can drag and drop different blocks within a page to create this really beautiful and really robust set of pages. We use Notion for literally everything on Holisticism. It is where our editorial calendars are, where all of our finances live, where our CRM is, everything, as well as my personal goals and our master to-do list for the business and for the employees, everything, everything, all of our files, basically, if they're not on my hard drive, live on Notion, and it has been a lifesaver and completely changed the game for us. So I really strongly recommend it to keep you organized and to just like keep your shit tight. It's also a really beautiful platform for sending proposals and making things aesthetic. If you want to create a mood board or you want to like do a mock-up for a website for a new client, or even if you wanted to use Notion as your website, which I've seen and I, I so strongly recommend, it's just a really cool tool. I love teaching this because I feel like it's been really kept only for tech bros and people who are like really techy and it is so powerful and I think that so many more people could be using it and it's much easier than it lets on to be. So I'm really interested in teaching more about Notion in 2021. But that's one of our tools that we use. I also personally use a couple of tools just for my sanity. I use something called Superhuman to balance my email inbox. That's for my work email. And for my personal email, I use hey.com, which is, it's a private email account, kind of like Gmail. You have to pay for it, but it's super organized. I love all the features that it contains. I'm able to like sort of highlight things within an email and save them as a clip, which comes into play with 
my notion and my second brain, which I'll talk about in a second. It's just definitely saved me a bunch of time. It also will screen out your emails so you can really easily get rid of spam or emails that you don't want to see all the time. And it organizes your receipts as well as your newsletters. So you have a completely different space for newsletters only. And that as someone who has probably like over 700 emails in their inbox right now on their work inbox and over a thousand in their personal inbox, at least that helps me save time because I'm not a slave to email. I used to be like an inbox zero person. And then I realized no one cares. I don't really care. And I was prioritizing other people over myself. So I'm not a slave to email anymore. Another thing that's really helpful for me for balancing my time is using something called x.ai. XAI is an AI scheduling bot that you can CC into your emails when you want to schedule a meeting with someone. So mine is called Andrew and they're my AI assistant. So let's say Wallace sends me an email and wants to have a meeting and I'll say, okay, perfect. Let me CC in Andrew. And then I just type out, Andrew, can you find a time 45 minutes for us next week to talk about the podcast? And Andrew will go into each of our Google calendars, find the best time that works for both of us, automatically schedule it, put in my Zoom link, and then send a confirmation to both of us. And it is so helpful, especially when I'm trying to find times with people who I've never met before, who want to hop on a phone call. I don't do pick your brain phone calls anymore because those are offensive to me, but people who, who want to chat about partnerships and collaborations and all that good stuff, I just send them an XAI and it has saved me so much time. So I love that for scheduling. And then personally, I use a couple things to stay organized and to like keep my shit tight. I use something called readwise.io. I read a lot of books. <laughs> I have an unlimited book budget. So I never feel bad about buying new books or buying Kindle books or buying eBooks or audiobooks. I think that I, I'm going to have this with my kids too. Like you can always have, I'm never going to say no to books and my employees as well, like, or my teammates, I should say, anytime they want to read a book, I send it to all of them because like, that's amazing. I would love to pay for you to read. That is my dream. So I read a ton of books and I noticed that although I'm a really fast reader, I don't have the best recall, which I think is pretty normal. I love highlighting because it helps me understand and like round in concepts that I like. But I wasn't looking at the highlights that I was taking for books or when I'd occasionally like be highlighting in a hardcover book, I'd go back and be like, wow, this was actually really meaningful what I highlighted. And I wish I had it somewhere other than just in this book. So I have switched to using an e-reader and I use Readwise, which basically aggregates everything that you've highlighted on the web or on your Kindle. And it puts it into my Notion. It adds it to a document in Notion, which is called my second brain. So everything that I've highlighted from articles to what I've highlighted in books to what I've pulled from podcasts to sometimes I'll see images on Instagram or captions on Instagram and I'll click on those and save them to my Notion second brain. Having that place where I can go and sort of like look at all the things that I've been thinking about and review what mattered to me at the time when I was reading it and see if it still lands and if it still resonates is really helpful for my recall. And I've noticed that I understand concepts so much more easily now that I've got that second brain. I've been working with that for about a year. Two more things. I love Thrive Market. Shameless plug for Thrive. I used to work at Thrive back. I was like one of the very, very early employees when we still worked out of a garage and we had like one working bathroom for the entire office. It was really fun and weird. It was definitely startup vibes. And I am not an employee of Thrive Market anymore and haven't been for a very long time, but I love Thrive because it saves me a bunch of time when it comes to grocery shopping. My partner is on the ketogenic diet because he has a brain tumor and so we don't want that to grow. So he doesn't eat sugar. And so there's so much keto stuff on Thrive that I can't always find at the grocery store. This kind of sounds like a commercial, but I just really love Thrive Market <laughs> and it does save me a ton of time because I can just order whatever it is that he needs and that we need. Like, all of our pantry staples on Thrive, basically everything and beauty products. They have great beauty products. Everything except for like meat and cheese and vegetables, we can get at Thrive Market. So we do. And that saves us so much time. And I think it also, it saves a lot of money because everything at Thrive is like at least 25% off, normally like 50% off. So super big fan of Thrive. And then finally, like the thing that saves me the most time and helps me 
not get burnt out is just saying no. <laughs> Read the book Essentialism. We talk about it a lot on our team, but asking yourself, like, is this essential? Is this truly essential? And very few things really are, but just being able to ask yourself that and then decide if it's essential or not for you to achieve whatever it is that you want for the outcome that you desire for the life that you want to live. Is this essential? Most of the time it isn't. And you can say no. And when you're saying yes to something, you're saying no to another thing in your life. So thinking about that too, if we're going to take on a new project, that means that we're going to say no to another project. Or if I'm going to say yes to meeting with a stranger, that means that I'm saying no to being with my partner or with my team or with my family or taking the time to myself. And am I okay with that? To a certain point, yes, but beyond another point, no, absolutely not. So that was a hard lesson for me to learn. That kind of flows into the next question, which are what are the best books that you read in 2020? I reread Essentialism and Atomic Habits every year. Atomic Habits only came out like two or three years ago, but I've read it like four times. Essentialism and Atomic Habits are my two favorite books. And I feel like Essentialism is the theory around being an essentialist, obviously. And Atomic Habits is kind of like how to be an essentialist in action. And those books saved my life. I loved the book Patriarchy Stress Disorder by Dr. Valerie Ryan. It was incredible. I so strongly recommend it because she doesn't really talk about like divine masculine and divine feminine, which really grinds my gears. Like I don't like it when people talk about that stuff. That's probably my own personal shadow, but it's not inclusive. Like it feels old and dated. We know that the gender binary doesn't exist. So to like call things the divine masculine and the divine feminine, it just doesn't feel correct to me. And I know that they don't mean like masculine versus feminine. Technically, I think that some people do, but most people are like, no, it's just it's not that. It's not like gendered, but it is because you're using gendered language. So either like let's use better language or let's not use that concept anymore is how I feel. So anyways, <laughs> that was a little, a little hot take. In Patriarchy Stress Disorder, while Dr. Valerie talks about being a woman in society, she's not like, you got to embody your divine feminine and not wear a bra and blah, blah, blah. Huge fan of not wearing bras over here. But I feel like she gives really tangible, thoughtful steps on not how to like embody the feminine, but how to like basically divest from patriarchy and to see patriarchy in your life and how it shows up across gender, right? Because it affects everyone. And that book was amazing. I so strongly recommend it, especially if you're feeling burnt out. Another book that I loved this year that I read was Conflict is Not Abuse. It was written a couple of years ago, I believe, by a queer woman author. And so it's a little more centered. It talks about cancellation culture, but it was written before the Me Too movement and before cancel culture really like came into the zeitgeist as something that we talked about a lot. And I just found it to be really, really helpful. The main crux of it is conflict is not abuse. So we can disagree. We can not have the same opinions, and that doesn't deem me being canceled or you being canceled. What abuse is different than conflict, which is disagreement. I can't articulate it well because I'm not as intelligent as this author is, but I found it to be really helpful because I am super, I think many people are afraid of saying something wrong or being wrong or disagreeing because we are so divided and divisive as a culture at this moment in time and just reframing the idea of conflict versus the idea of abuse and seeing how that could play out was really helpful for me. So strong recommend on that. And I also read a ton of fiction. I love reading fiction. My favorite books this year were Conjure Woman, The Eighth Detective, obviously Normal People. I'm a very picky reader, so I read a lot of fiction books that I hate. <laughs> I'll say The Courage to be Disliked is a book that I really, really loved. And it's about Adler's idea of doing our own work. So like, what is mine? What is mine to work on and focus on? And what is yours? And the sort of like discernment of tasks as people. And I found it to be, I loved the way it was written. And I didn't agree with all of it, but I found it to be really useful. Again, for that conversation of like, ownership and cancellation and all that good stuff, <laughs> all that good stuff. So those are my books that I'm reading. Okay. Next question. What are your powerful nighttime routines? Okay. Right now I'm really on a, since quarantine, this has kind of been the vibe. Turn off the computer at four, 
or like puts around on Instagram for a couple hours for like, you know, an hour, make dinner at five or six with my partner when he's home, sit down, have dinner. Normally we eat for 15 minutes and then we sit there for like 45 minutes and just talk and then clean up the house a little bit. Sometimes (laughs) he does that more than I do. And then we'll usually like make tea or make a little hot chocolate drink, a keto hot chocolate drink, and then read on the couch and listen to records. That's been the vibe lately. But I also really like to do ritual at night. I'd prefer to do if I'm doing like a full moon or a new moon or a spell, any of those rituals, I'll do them at night. I feel more grounded at night than I do in the morning. Like my energy is like a ping pong ball in the morning. I just like want to make things and be active and I don't always want to be like super pensive. So I find it easier to like calm down and unwind in the evening. And I also love a skincare routine (laughs) because I am almost 32. So I love a skincare routine and because I'm getting married, hopefully having a wedding in, in November. So I am just working on that youthful glow that I really appreciate doing gua sha at night and just having some time to myself with my face and just touching my skin. And yeah, I like that. It very is very calming to me. And that's pretty much it. And we go to bed. I don't know. He goes to bed at like 10, 1030. And then normally I'm in bed with him. Sometimes I'll read in bed. Sometimes I fall asleep before he does. But yeah, that's pretty much the nighttime routine. Okay, next question. Can you talk more about mercury energy and how you use it for your business? I'm curious to hear your thoughts about it. Ooh, yes. This came from one of our North Noters. I love mercury. First, let's put that out there. My mercury personally is an Aquarius. So I know and in your natal chart in astrology, mercury is all about obviously communication and I feel like action. And I love Mercury because he is the messenger, obviously, but he's also between two worlds. He also is non-binary. Or they are non-binary, I should say. Like Hermes, Mercury is constantly changing. They're androgynous. So sometimes they have a female form. Sometimes they have a male form. Sometimes they're a little bit of both. And as the messenger between the gods and the humans, between heaven and humanity, they straddle both worlds. They look human, but they're also a god, and they can fit into both spaces when they need to, which is also like, you know, they're obviously the trickster. So I like Mercury energy because I feel like that is definitely my entity that I embody. And other than Diana, I feel like Mercury is my vibe. So When I think about my Mercury Aquarius, that's how I communicate with the world and how the world perceives me or how my message lands, I should say. So I know that sometimes the way that I talk and the way that I communicate can come off as like a little bit aloof, a little bit like high, maybe more intellectual than heart centered. And now that I know that about myself, I can like sort of hedge against that or like lean into it, right? Knowing that that's how I communicate with people. And same thing with my business, understanding the mercury of my business and the work that I do helps me understand how to communicate with people who are here to listen to our message. And that can tell us, you know, maybe if you have, I don't know, a mercury cancer, Again, I'm not an astrologer, so don't come for me if I'm wrong, but let's say you have a mercury cancer. Well, maybe the way that you communicate yourself is actually like you're a little guarded and really on the inside, you're very emotional and you have such depth and you want people to feel safe and comfortable, but maybe it takes a little while for people to get there. So how could I think about that in the way that my company communicates? Maybe it means that... I actually need a podcast because I need people to like spend some time with me and to understand me. Maybe it means that I set up an email sequence that's sort of like an intro sequence that's long enough to explain where you come from, but also gets really to the heart of who you are. Maybe I just need to know that, that like I come off as hard. So, or like I've got this hard exterior shell. So I got to like crack jokes and be inviting and be welcoming because That's sort of the first impression that my communication style gives. So I find that understanding your Mercury, I feel like it helps with everything. It helps you communicate with the world and helps people see, in turn, understand you the way you want to be understood. 
So my recommendation on working with Mercury is understand how it pops up in your own chart, maybe what it's connected to in your business's chart. And also think about how you can invite that energy into your life, whether it's adding something for Mercury to your altar or practicing doing ritual around Mercury or just calling on Mercury to help guide you as you're creating and innovating and making things. And Mercury obviously also rules technologies and innovation. So Mercury is fun to work with. Okay, next question. Some insight on community care, please. Oh, I think that I can answer this really quickly, but when I think about community care, I think about mutual aid, I think about elevating community over the individual. And not that we're harming the individual in order to make the community better, but we are thinking about the individual as part of a community and what is good for the community is inevitably going to be good for the individual. And when it comes to community care, from my perspective and from from what I'm learning and studying, that means empowering the community to take care of the community as opposed to having a singular individual leading the community. And so that's really, I think, what we practice in the North Node and what we try to practice at Holisticism is how can we be in community together? How can we be helping each other? Maybe we can provide the container, but we're not always at the helm of every idea. We are allowing for more sort of like buds to pop up through the soil and to bloom and to support our community in the way that's mutually beneficial for all. So I'm thinking about that a lot. And also just community care in terms of mutual aid means instead of going through an individual and organization that is patriarchal and decides where to put money, you are directly giving to individuals within your community. So lots to talk about on on mutual aid and community care. And I don't know if that answers the question, but That is what I'm thinking about. Okay. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on sobriety, specifically down to cannabis, but that's a major theme circling my wellness life for the past one to two years, especially as I've wanted to do the Akashic Records more. Maybe not in your wheelhouse as much, but I'm always looking to hear things about recovery. Oh, okay, great. So I will say that I'm not in recovery. I am not completely sober. Well, I I am right now, but... (laughs) <laughs> can you imagine if I was just like smoking and token on this podcast episode? That'd be hilarious. No. So I'm not sober and I don't think I've, I wouldn't consider myself to ever have had a substance abuse problem, which would lead me to a 12 step program or to sobriety, but I don't do a lot of drugs and I don't drink a lot. So I'm pretty much sober straight edge. I did not drink in high school. The first time I started drinking was in college. Same thing with drugs. And so maybe I'm a little bit of a late bloomer, but my partner also doesn't drink because of the keto thing, because of the health issues. So we don't drink a ton here. I'll do like some biodynamic wine every now and then, but I haven't been in January. I've been doing dry January. I would say that I'm definitely not an expert on this. So I want to bring someone on to talk about sobriety, but I love that it's becoming something that's more popular. I lived in New York from my early twenties and Drinking was the culture, and now when I moved to L.A. when I was 26, 25, I noticed I just didn't drink because I just didn't as much as I did when I was definitely as much as I did when I was in college and certainly as much as I did in my early 20s in New York. It just didn't feel as easy or as fun to drink, and so I kind of stopped drinking at that point as much for sure, but I think with the Akashic Records or with any wellness spiritual journey, with anything, It's great to test things, to just see how useful they are in your life. I'm doing this with coffee right now. I love coffee. Does coffee love me? I'm guessing no, because man, it is a real bee. It's like making me lose my period and I'm addicted to it. I just love it. But do I really need coffee to like wake up in the morning? No, absolutely not. In fact, I actually feel great when I don't have coffee in the morning. I just love coffee and everything that it means to me emotionally. So I'm cutting it out for a while just to see, like, what's my dependency on this thing? And I feel like we can apply this throughout our lives and our spiritual lives. Like, do we actually need tarot cards to, like, get the answer? Do I actually need to ask my Akashic Records about that question about that ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend? Like, do I actually know the answer inside, deep down inside if I just get quiet? Do I actually need a Kundalini Kriya in order to meditate? What if I just sat in silence? Not that these things aren't useful, just... 
do we really need all the bells and whistles all the time? Do we always need tools in order to touch base with who we are or to amplify who we are? And so I think it's great to practice sobriety every now and then and just see what it feels like. Even like maybe cutting out something like dairy or sugar and seeing what it feels like, right? Maybe maybe it doesn't matter at all to you, but maybe you're going to feel awesome and you just need to you need to figure it out. You need to test it. So mm, my thoughts on the Akashic Records and sobriety are, yes, you need to be sober for 24 hours before you open your Akashic Records. But I have personally found that you don't you don't have to like have completely abstained from 20 for 24 hours to open the Akashic Records. That's my personal experience, but your personal experience might be different. For me, my records just say, we don't want you to drink or reach for a substance or even use us in a moment of like triage and panic when you are trying to avoid looking and you're looking everywhere but yourself for the answer. When you're like, you know, when you're like, oh my God, I got to, I got to pull a card right now. That's the worst time I found to actually pull a card or to ask, talk to your spirits or to talk to your Akashic records. And so my team's like, don't do that and don't like chug a glass of wine because you're stressed. If you do that, then like you're avoiding the problem and we're not going to give you an answer. But if you can be a grown up about it or just like an evolved person about it and not freak out and not panic and like stay with the discomfort for a second and maybe sleep on it and then open your records, then we'll give you all the answers that you need. So that's my experience and your experience is probably completely different, but you should ask your records. That's the best way to get an answer. Okay. And I want to talk more about sobriety, but I'm not an expert to talk about it. So I'll, I'll bring someone on the podcast to, to chat more about that. But I'm also, I'm not a cannabis person. I am a big fan of microdosing mushrooms, especially I've noticed a huge difference in like my depression and anxiety when I do as well as my productivity. I'm so much more productive when I've microdosed on mushrooms. And I'm a fan of using other substances for like thoughtful journeying. I've never done ayahuasca, but some other substances I am a fan of. So that's that. All right, last question. I'd love to hear how you've personally navigated the ups and downs emotionally and mentally. What practices have helped you ground in? therapy. No, but really all my spiritual practices have really helped me. I think I've had a very lucky life. I've been very privileged. I've also had some, you know, we've all had our shit, some tragedies, some traumas, some, some things. I would say most recently starting holisticism was amazing that came out of a traumatic breakup and then raising money from investors was also very traumatic. I had a strange assault happen from an investor that I didn't really know what to do about. And so that sort of triggered me to go see a therapist as well as being with my partner, Ethan, and being in love with him and trying to be a good, a good partner. So yeah, that definitely helped me through the ups and downs of seeing a therapist. Also, building an altar and like tending to my altar always helps me stay grounded because there's something about the ritual of like lighting the incense on the altar, lighting the candles, looking at my ancestors' pictures, fixing the water, adding food if I need to, pulling a tarot card or just like tending to that space really soothes me as well as the garden and working with herbs and plants. So growing plants in our garden for me has been a great project over the last year and a half to like help center me. I check on the garden every morning and every night and I'll work on it on the weekends and just like touching the plants and feeling the soil. It brings me back down to the planet and back to earth and then using, actually using the plants. Also plants have taught me so much about abundance and like asking for enough. Like if I grow too much of something and I don't use it, it just withers in the garden and dies. And that's such a waste, right? And I want to use it for something good. So I'll I'll like make it into the compost or I'll give it to friends or I'll try to store it in a special way, make a tincture out of it, make a tea out of it, whatever. But I've learned so much from plants and from gardening. And as a witch, that's really meaningful to me. I'm definitely a green witch. Plus, They offer protection. They add to the energy of our home and our space. So I plant herbs and plants 
that are protective and that also are from my lineage. So I'm growing rue in our backyard right now, which is not really something that you can eat a ton of. It's like kind of poisonous, but it's very popular in the Mediterranean. And it's been just so lovely to use rue day to day. You know, I can dry it and use it to smoke out our our space and like cleanse our space. I braid it into a little wreath and put it on the altar. Those practices of like getting out of my head really, really help me emotionally and mentally. I go in and out of meditation. I sometimes love meditation. Sometimes like I hate it, but I really love piano and I've been learning the piano this year. And so sitting down and practicing the piano and just singing a song. I'm not a good singer. I'm not. (laughs) <laughs> it's not good. But dude, singing Taylor Swift. <laughs> oh man, singing champagne problems to myself at like two o'clock in the afternoon when I'm stressed. That is the best medicine. Like that is so, I feel so connected to myself afterwards. It's like probably amazing for your fifth chakra. It's probably amazing just for like, honestly, your vagal nerve, like that's vagal nerve toning whenever we sing or we hum. So the vagal nerve, the vagus nerve connects the brain and the gut, it's the brain gut axis. And if we tone that vagus nerve, it can calm us down. It can increase our serotonin. It's just really good for you. It helps you recover more quickly from stress and trauma. That's a practice that I really love to do. And then just being present in my body and with my partner. So we try to work out a couple of times a week and not being on my phone. Like I notice a major difference in my well-being when I'm not on my phone and when I delete Instagram off my phone, I'm so much happier. And it's not because I'm in avoidance of what's happening in the world. It's because there's so much noise on that app that it is easier for me to hear myself when that isn't around. And then finally, I do very regular quarterly retreats to the desert. So I'll go out to the desert for a couple of days by myself and just not have anything planned because I have so much to do day to day to make the business run and to just like, you know, be a person going and taking some time by myself, which I know is a luxury. I'm so privileged to be able to do so. I don't have children. I don't know what I'm going to do when I have kids, but right now that really helps me. So that's how I keep myself grounded. And I think also just going back to like, why am I here? Like, what's the point of this? Whenever I feel overwhelmed, like what's the intention? And knowing that as long as I'm intentional, then I'll stay on the path. And being open to the path changing as long as the intention is clear. I might not get what I want in the way that I want to get it, but eventually I will get what's right. (laughs) as long as I stay on the path. And that doesn't really make sense. But do you know what I mean? This is why I don't vibe with manifestation because I'm like, my brain's so small. How could I possibly manifest? Like what I think I want is so small. I don't know so much shit. <laughs> like I don't even know what I'm capable of. I'm I'm capable of so much more than I can even imagine or realize. So to like make a list of things that I want and quote unquote manifest them, first off, is it white privilege or is it manifestation? And two, I'm going to change my mind. I think I want that right now, but like, do I actually want that? I feel like it just doesn't give me freedom to to change my mind. And that's just me personally. If manifestation works for you, awesome. I just don't vibe with it because, again, I'm so small. My consciousness is so small and I'm expanding every day and I'm evolving and changing every day. And what I want and what I want my look life to look like, the broad strokes don't change too much, but the the little brush strokes do, you know, sometimes I want this type of house. Sometimes I don't even want a house. Sometimes I want a nice car. Sometimes I'm like, fuck, I I hate driving. (laughs) Right. So really for me, those are just like the, the things that are not so important. What really matters is like, how do I want to feel at the end of my life? How do I want to feel about what I've done and who I've been and who I've helped and who I've created helped to create if we ever have kids. So yeah, just going back to like, how do I want to feel really helps me feel grounded and saying no. (laughs) Okay. So I think that's all the questions. And I definitely went a lot longer than I thought I was going to go. Damn it. Every time, but hopefully you will enjoy this and you won't be mad at me. Okay. That was great. I love you. Thanks for listening. Stay cool out there and we'll talk soon.